Sarah, did I just see your, your head in someone's crotch on TV? It's the best career move I've ever made. It's just, you learn so much about human beings through learning about their sex lives. The things that I see, the conversations that I have, Hollywood couldn't write it. So, obviously, you mentioned being Ugandan and so forth. Mm. And then you did the sex clinic. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day you only got one life people are dying that yeah. they don't need to die because yeah. they're not getting checked out so sarah peckham's your neck of the woods yeah peckham's my neck of the woods you must have seen it change like Listen. year on year you've seen it live like me Listen. i only see it when i'm going to like my auntie's house here and there mine's like you know google maps when you change the year 20, 2002 uh -huh. 2050 you're seeing it gradually i it in like? real time it's mad it's actually mad to see it in real time so um my parents immigrated from uganda in the my dad immigrated in like the 80s and he moved to deptford that was where he that's that was his first stop but that's where he started off moved to Deptford for like I think a year or two and then when we came along we then moved to Peckham um and then I lived in Peckham for like two or three years this is from like let's say 1990 to like 93 so when I was super little and then we moved to East Dulwich so I grew up in East Dulwich but Dulwich, Campbell, Peckham they're all like around yeah, the same yeah, so if you grew yeah. up in one of them you know the other kind of thing so I lived in Peckham for a while grew up in Peckham that's where we always get our African food on a Sunday because you know Dulwich is posh and fancy in it but we're all sat out Peckham to get our plantain to get you know so I grew up around Peckham my parents got uh, uh, married in Peckham so yeah I've seen the growth and it's mad do you know when I knew it was a wrap for Peckham when, Go <laughs> when, I saw, when I saw an honest burger and a Costa coffee I Can said that's imagine? it it's I said it's a wrap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're coming for us like they came for Shoreditch. But um, yeah, I so I've lived all over London like throughout my entire life. Um, and I moved back south about three and a half years ago now. So now I live back in Peckham. And honestly, there's no place like home. Like we were talking before, like home is where the heart is. Yeah, and so yeah, being honestly. back in south, I just, I love it. And it's nice now that... Peckham has evolved and I think if it stays the way it is now I think it'd be really nice because you still have that mold, that di the diversity you can walk down the high street there's a place for everybody and I think if it stays the way it is then it, it's a dream but I think any further and yeah. pushing out the original Peckhamites then yeah I don't know there's still some original features yes <laughs> In Pekka, you can still see some original features there. Um, other than South, um, what would you say is your next best area that you've lived in London? Oh, other than South, my next best area... I'd say Battersea, um, Battersea's still southwest, so it's still south. Okay, I would say... Chelsea. About region. Oh, no, God. Region. So, like, west, northwest, oh, okay. east or north. Oh, okay, I'll say west. Yeah, but still, uh, south, south is still king, but second best would be west. Don't tell me about East London. I lived in East London. <laughs> I don't <laughs> ever don't get me started with East London. Unless, I always uh, said I'm trying to forget my East London era. <laughs> East, East London needs a Batman. That's <laughs> no, you, no, East London is Gotham City. 100%. It's Gotham City, bro. This Batman present, like, just 100%. to handle all of these uh, minor petty crimes, bro. Man, <laughs> East London is a jungle. Yeah. I was like, I'm not built for the East End. <laughs> no, East is, East is a madness, like, but I feel like, I feel like, Depending on where you're at, you just get used to it, right? So yeah. you don't you don't really feel it. Like I grew up in East London. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I've lived in South. When I go back, I'm like, what? How did I make it? Where did why I, I feel nervous in the places that I grew up in, like because it is just so hood. Like, yeah. like there's no it's like there's no happiness there. Like I don't know how That's happiness goes to die. Like, the place just looks like nobody cared. Like it's, they didn't bother to do any refurbishments, nothing. Like I've gone back. I remember I did a, I did a documentary with BBC and we went back to my estate, and the estate looks exactly the same. As you left it. Except they just got cages now. They got like iron bars on the outside so people can't get in and out anyhow. See, that's what bothers me when it comes to gentrification is that they'll pick one area spend all the money in that one area but then okay so like Shoreditch yeah you can go to a nice place in East London it's like all done up but then you go to like your mill you know all these other places and it's like they, they look exactly like they did when I was little have, have you noticed yeah. they've twanged us on the gentrification bits as well though on the on the how they're developing them because you go to especially places in East, right? Right. You see, you got the stairwell and you could just see the concrete. Yeah. They haven't used any plaster. Yeah. The air conditioning is exposed. Yeah. Now it's the trend. They've told us it's the trendy look, right? Oh, yeah, no, <laughs> so yeah. we just, uh, we're just we accepting totally unfinished accepted. buildings. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you see how smart they are. We're so easily conceived. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy. It's yeah. crazy. But no, I'm a South London girl to the core. At heart. Yeah. Well, you love sure. it. Yeah. So, 
Guys, you must have heard already. We've got the amazing Sarah Malindua. Did I say yes, that right? Yes, yes. I love time. that. I love that. <laughs> Sarah is not only one of my good friends, like, but she's actually someone I, I actually look up to in the industry. Like when I was coming in, she gave me bare tips on like things to do with TV, what to expect. Like I think in life sometimes you need people that have gone before. And sometimes when people go before they're like they're so focused in what they are, they don't have time for people that are coming back and I understand. But Sarah just gave me so much love, so much support, so much encouragement. Like and you know, if you don't know her, she's an actual qualified nurse. So you know bear of you getting your 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 medical advice online from people that are not qualified. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not at anybody, but be careful taking them tablets. I'm just saying, but she's actually qualified, you know, it's TV personality, model. She, not, she, she doesn't like to add that one because she's trying to be humble, but hella model, see you bare pictures on bare covers and that model like, and yet she's just the amazing, the most amazing person. Like her journey is fantastic. You're going to hear it today. Like Sarah, thank you for taking time Aww, and joining us today. No, anytime. When you told me, I was like, yeah, I'll be there. No. Yeah, definitely. Do you remember when we first met? Yeah, BBC. BBC. Yeah, I'll never forget. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, you know when you just meet somebody and you just... Click straight away. Yeah, you can just tell that you can just feel their spirit, you know, and my spirit just took to Emmanuel straight away. So this was, this is years ago. Now. Yeah, this, this is a like, long time. This, this is, is pre B BC, before COVID. Yeah, before COVID. Yeah, it was before, <laughs> yeah, it was before COVID. Yeah, this is a good... Yeah. Thing. I, I think I was like, I think I was promoting like the next series of the sex clinic. Yeah, something. you was. Yeah, so you this was about five or six years ago, ago, if not yeah, more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just remember thinking, oh, just thinking how amazing it is that you know, because I'd never seen anybody like in in terms of on the in the public eye, and I'm sure they were there, but like who done like about um like uh like money and investment and everything that Emmanuel does. I remember thinking, oh, this is great, and especially and the thing that stood out for me is like, oh my god, yes, a black person doing this as well, because I was like, you know, you, we can get into that later, but you know, and I remember thinking, oh, this is so good. And I remember thinking there is a hole in the in the market for this. Like, this is something that is so... And I remember thinking, oh, he's going to go places. So, and this is my favorite person on Instagram. Let me, I'm not even just saying it. I'm not even actually just saying it because I'm sat on this couch. But, like, your Instagram, I'm, I'm always, like, sharing it on my stories because I'm like, the way you deliver the message as well is... Like, you can understand it. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's yeah. And I think what you guys do is brilliant. So, yeah, thank you for having me here. No, thank you for coming, man. Thank you for coming, man. We really appreciate it. Like, I guess... Th the whole point of this this podcast is for us to show people like bread and butter, like how people make their money, how people, how money, people make money work for them, how they make their lives work for them. And I think for you, obviously going into nursing, what made you want to do that? Because that's not necessarily a career you go for, for money. Right, right. So what made you want to go into nursing? Do you know what? From when I was a little girl, I always wanted to be a nurse. I was very, I was very much a daddy's girl. So I was uh, now looking at it. Then my dad, <laughs> my dad was very clever. He would always make me do like little things for him. So whenever I was sick, I would, like look after him. And like I was always, I was his young. He had three daughters, four kids in total. But I was his youngest daughter, so I was always like his little assistant, always with him, kind of thing. So I always look after him, and I always loved looking after my dad. So I'd like get, get, like sort his socks out. Like I really loved whenever he was ill, I'd be the one to like nurse him, kind of thing. And he would always be like, "Oh, Sarah, you're gonna make." A brilliant nurse and his mom you know his grandmother who was called Sarah who named me after she was a nurse and a midwife and so he was always like oh Sarah you know you've got a good heart you're gonna you should be a nurse and I, I, I think I think he just sort of planted that seed and so growing up I always I've always been a people person and I always, always liked the sci science as well in, in school I always felt like biology was my favorite so it just felt like a natural I, n I didn't really think of anything else so even way before you were asked to think about you know career day at school and stuff I always thought I want to be a nurse like that's what I want to be so when I um when I was 17 so I went to uni a year earlier so I went to uni at 17 and then by 20 I'd graduated and then I was qualified nurse then yeah so for me it, it just felt it's just it was just something that I always wanted to kind of do yeah that that's, that's really interesting happened. because a lot of people don't get all of those signs telling you you want to do something yeah and from where I'm sitting it looked like it sounded like it's really really strong like you were effectively helping your dad and you used to say that you're going to be a nurse. Yeah, Your yeah. great-grandmother was also called Sarah and was a nurse. Yeah. And it's kind of something that you it felt like you had a natural passion to do. And, yeah. I, and I guess that's one step of it, right? You became a nurse, but off the back of becoming a nurse, mm -hmm. sometimes in this world, your passion doesn't necessarily lead to an income. Right. And we will, let's not get into the NHS, but the NHS... <laughs> NHS can't ginger you for the rest of your life. Right. You know, do you get what I'm trying yeah, to say? Yeah. And you found a way to take your passion and still fulfill your passion by becoming a nurse, but you've become a podcast host. 
a TV star, a model, so many other things. Talk about, talk to us about where that change started from. Yeah. Like, what was the first thing that made it click, that made you say that, do you know what, this is something that I'm already doing. I can um, tweak or I can do something to kind of take it away from just being a nurse, basically. Do you know what, the funny thing is, a lot of the things that I've done, I've not, it, it's not been like a conscious effort that, right, I'm going to, like, I've done, like, lots of different things in different industries but the, I've only ever really chosen two career paths and that was being a nurse and being a fashion stylist so those are the two things outside of being a nurse my only my, my other thing that I was like this is what I this is really what's what I like to do my passion was to work in fashion never wanted to be a model never wanted to be a designer I always wanted to dress people like styling people and like that was my thing always wanted to be a celebrity stylist like people for the red carpet and everything so then when I was um when I was a around 20 I'd say about three years into my nursing career I was working in acute medicine which I did for about five years before I specialized in sexual health and um and I thought you know what I think I'm ready to try something else about three years into my career I was working weekends nights I was exhausted and I was only like really young I was still a baby so like all my friends would be out on the weekend like in the sunshine and I'd be on my way to a night shift like the first of like four night shift and so I think after a while just that stress and especially at a very young age just the physical psychological like it's a stressful environment to be working in to be exposed to at such a young age so then I thought oh maybe let me try something else and at the time we got we were going back like 17 eight or 18 years ago like we're going back a while now but um at the time my ex-boyfriend he was a property developer and he was very super ambitious like property was his thing like he started I can't what, what did he do before I think he had like a I think he just like a normal nine to five job but he didn't do the whole university route I think his grandfather died then he got like a lump sum of money but he was very intelligent and was always like business minded so he started off a property development business and he sort of transitioned his career from one thing to the other and I sort of saw how successful he was Meanwhile, I was here moaning, talking about, oh, you know what, I want something to do something else, but I don't know what I want to do. I want to work in fashion, but I don't know what to do kind of thing. Then he bought me a camera for Christmas and he said, right, write down a list of the reasons why you can't be a stylist. And if you can, then I'll leave you alone. And I couldn't think of anything. So then he gave me that camera. This is before we had Instagram, Twitter, social media. And then I was like, right, I've got this camera. Now I have to like go out and start. Then I started blo uh, vlogging. Yeah. This is before, again, before social, uh, Instagram and everything. And this is when, not MySpace, uh, well, there was another, it like a blog. Bebo? Be uh... not, I think so, just after Bebo. I forget what it's called, but it was, it was like a vlog thing anyway. So and I started like doing street style pictures of people. Pixel. It, like, like, was it Pixel? Oh, do you know, it's going to bug me. Yeah, it's going to bug Google me too. It. I, I couldn't me. leave it. And you so started next to it. I had to, I had to throw it in there, make sure. I know, it's going to bug me. All interview, I've been thinking. Um, and then, yeah, so that I started like uh, putting pictures of people who I thought were dressed well, yeah. building like a little, like, page for myself there and then I started I joined a website called Star Now I don't know if you guys know it so it's for like up and coming actors models stylists photographers and, and people in the creative who are like wanting to collaborate with like minded people so then I started getting on there and like putting teams together to like build my portfolio as a stylist so I'd get a photographer a model a makeup artist then we'd come up with a concept we'd do shoots and then before you know it I work with better photographers better makeup artists then you get agency models and then my career and then I started being a stylist and then that's how sort of my career in styling went in um and I think sorry while you're doing all of that were you nursing at the time I was nursing at the time wow. I was a full-time nurse still so I was a full-time nurse and then on the weekends I was spending my weekends doing my side hustle and building that and so fast forward like a couple of years later I got it was, it's a funny story I'll share it um so one of my friends she works in PR for something I like food PR completely different and she saw a tweet on Twitter and it said the Hoxton Fashion Show are looking for a stylist. So this is a radio show in Hoxton. And, and I didn't even know it was a radio show, actually. It just said the Hoxton Fashion Show. So I thought it was a fashion show. Uh, looking for a stylist. So my friend uh, sent me the screenshot. And she's like, oh, Sarah, I know you're like up and coming in the styling world or whatever. This might be of interest. So I thought, oh, okay, cool. That would be really cool to like style a fashion show. Then I thought, okay. So I, I sent him a DM and he was like, yeah, do you want to come, come down to, um, what was it? Amherst Terrace, which is in like Hackney. Yeah, come down to the studio. We'll have a little meeting. It was all like quite relaxed. So I was like, okay, cool. Met him on like a Tuesday afternoon, I think it was. And so we're talking, talking. And then he's like, yeah, you know, the show is every Wednesday at 10 o'clock. And so I remember thinking in the middle of this meeting, like there's a fashion show every week. Like you have to, I have to I thought, that's weird. Normally you don't do a fashion show every week. So I thought, oh, this is bizarre. And, and then, 
throughout the the interview as he was speaking then then it then it the penny dropped that this is a radio show yeah. like this isn't a fashion show like i thought and then i was like I played along because I didn't want to look like an idiot, right? So I was like, oh, okay, yeah. And then at the end, I was like, look, I've, I'm not a presenter. I've never done this before. Um, but, and he was like, yeah, no, that's fine. Like, we'll train you up for a few weeks. When we think you're ready, we'll go live. And that was kind of my, that's how I sort of got into the entertainment industry okay. and like going to events and sort of building a name as a personality kind of thing for yeah. myself. So I did this show that was about fashion while I was sort of building my, career as a stylist then i had the fox and fashion show which was a radio show and at the time it was doing really well for itself because it had like really cool like presenters on there who are now like re doing really well um off the back of that um and so it was a really good position to be in and then i learned how to do radio that's how i sort of honed in my presenting skills um and then i then i'd get invited to like different events red carpet events because now i'm a radio personality and people want to invite you to things so that you can they can come on your show and talk about their brands and that's that was kind of my introduction to being for from going to like behind the scenes as a stylist to being like a fashion insider and like doing like front row at fashion week and that kind of thing. So it just kind of happened organically, but the styling thing I chose and the nursing and then all the presenting and everything that came from that, that all, all sort of happened organically, I'd say. I think that's really, really interesting to hear because I guess in this day and age, right, we live in a, in a, in a life where a lot of people feel like they deserve everything. Oh, the entitlement is... Uh, it's crazy, unreal. right? It's crazy. And a lot of people don't understand that you really have to go out there and get it. And a lot of people may see you and see the finished products, but what they really don't know is that you were working as a full-time nurse and everybody knows a full-time nurse can be full capacity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, That's no it, you're done. Off. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Honestly. And then you're also working as an up-and-coming stylist and then you're also a radio presenter as well, which is insane. But people don't really see that. No. While you were doing the radio in Hackney, when you first started, was it paid or was it... I didn't get paid a pound or penny for the three years. I did that show for three and a half years, if four, four years. I didn't get paid one episode for that. And the thing is, I didn't do it for the money anyway. Because the thing is, I saw the opportunity. It wasn't where, it wasn't my plan. It was God's plan. Like yeah. that was some, a, a direction that I was sort of led in. But the thing with me, if I see an opportunity and I can think, okay, I might be able to do something with this. I won't, because I'm a very long-term thinker. I won't think of the here and now. Because the amount of people will be like, I ain't doing it for free. I ain't doing Listen, if you know how much money, even even when I was at the height of my career as a stylist, yes, on my Instagram, I was working with all these like people from like Game of Thrones and I was doing like like front row covers for like all these different like people and people, everyone's like, Ross, oh, Sarah, you're killing it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm killing it because I'm doing all that, but I'm not getting paid. <laughs> I still have to hustle as a nurse. Like, in, especially in the fashion industry, there's not a lot of money. It's all... Because careers in fashion traditionally are reserved for middle class white people, essentially. Like people from working class backgrounds don't go into careers as fashion because yeah. you simply can't afford to do that and hustle. So for me, yeah, radio, I didn't get paid at all for that. But after three years, I took the opportunities that it gave me and the, the contacts that I made and where it got me. Had I not done had I not stuck out with that, I wouldn't be where I am today because it really did give me, like I learned a lot from that in terms of as a presenter, but then I learned all sorts, even just work in business, how to, how to network, how to connect, like the things, you know, just so many little transferable skills that to this day, I'm still reaping the benefits of working for free. Yeah, and I think that's just amazing to hear and that's what this podcast is about because a lot of people are going to see the finished product but they're not seeing all of the work you've done behind the scenes like you're telling certain people work for free for three and a half years they'll look at you, oh, like, look you're at you like you're mad basically but you have to do it and while you're doing it like you say you're building connections yeah. you're mastering your craft yeah. and you're getting exposure to the industry that you want to go in yeah. and you did go into and kill it in essentially mm. but I think what's it, one of the things I hear when I listen to your stories is number one the people around you mm. so like you said you had your ex-boyfriend who yeah. motivated you you had a friend who saw what you was doing and right. said oh and, and I think that's one of the things that people forget is like there are people around and it's like if you haven't got the right people around you mm. they can't push you to where you're trying to get to it's like you can try and do stuff on your own but having people around you to like like you said if you, did, you saw your ex-boyfriend do something now you knew it was possible if he can if he can transition I can transition so yeah. now I know that's possible yeah. you had a friend that worked in PR and because you were physically they saw you do stuff mm -hmm. when an opportunity came they thought of you yeah. whereas if you weren't doing anything yeah. when that opportunity came they would you wouldn't have come to their mind do oh, you know 100%. what i mean even though you're friends mm -hmm. like they wouldn't think oh so and so is good for exactly yeah, because yeah. they wouldn't have stayed they would sh she would have seen your work and been like oh yes i know sarah's doing something in this mm -hmm. space so then when the opportunity came it clocks Straight in their mind you're on their radar, you're on their radar. Mm -hmm. so it shows that you have to do action so 
as well as have people around you. So I think, you know, anyone listening that like wants to kind of emulate, they have to make sure that not only are they doing the work and they're putting themselves out there, but they also have the right people around yeah, them that the can support them. Yeah, the company you keep is yeah. so important. Yeah, bad company was, what has it say? Bad company... Uh, something, something, good behavior, or something. There, there's, there's something deep and like there's, a, there's, a, there's a something in there. Um, but it's so true. The company keeps speaks volumes, isn't it? Um, and the people can either hold you back or propel you to the right direction. So it's definitely important for sure. Definitely. And so, like with the, with the nursing, how did, how did you? Because uh, like, like, like Ty was saying, how did you have the energy to keep going? Because for a lot of people, they would say, I speak to people all the time, and they're like, I don't make enough money. And I'm like, okay, so what are you doing like after work? And they're like, yeah. my work is so 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 demanding mm. that after work, I, I just all I can do is eat and sleep and then go back to work. Mm. But you were doing something really demanding, like physically demanding, yeah. mentally demand. Because obviously, whether you like it or not, as humans, we take other people's pain. So you're oh, yes. you, you're you're literally seeing people every day that need help, and it's almost like you're taking you're trying to help them and you're taking on their burden as your own as you're trying to help them. So that's mentally draining as well as physically draining. And obviously, sometimes there's good news, sometimes there's bad news, yeah. and it's like you have to deal with that and then finish work, switch that off, and then yeah. go and go into. How did you? What, what was it? Your desire to to win, or was it was it a certain reason why? Did you have a certain thing that you wanted to achieve? What kept you enough energy to keep going? Do you know what? I think it's because I loved what I was doing, um, and I think because of all the reasons that you've just highlighted, just being being so young and having such a uh, a serious profession and like it's you know uh, physically emotionally psychologically you know um, pressurizing work environment. I think then everything else that I did was so easy in comparison. Like, so then I really enjoyed the fashion industry and the things that people might take for granted and moan about, I really loved it. And I think, I think it's, it's a combination of things. Also, I think, I think I was just young and hungry at that time as well. Yeah. Um, and again, it goes back to, I had the right people around me, people who were not going to let me have a lie in and wake up at midnight or midday, you know, like, I, like my, my boyfriend at the time was very much like a go getter. So th- for me, that was, that made the biggest difference. Cause again, the company you keep is so important, especially if you do, if you are somebody who has big goals and you do really, you know, you really want to, to leave your mark on the world. You do need to surround yourself with the right people. So I think for me, having that really helped but also I think I think I was just very I was just hungry I was really I really wanted to make something myself in the fashion industry and I, I think I just had that quiet self-belief um that I like I knew I could do it and I don't know I just I, and I think it's just I think it's just a personality thing like if I'm like if I tell myself I'm gonna do something I won't stop until I do it kind of thing so I think it was that but I just I but also I think you have to do things for the right reason and I think we live in this especially with social media you find people end up chasing other people's dreams because you think oh so and so is doing that I can do that because yeah, it looks easy you know and I'm like is that what you want to do or is this are you clout chasing is this what because you think this would give you the most you know like for what reason do you want to do it is this something that you, for the right reasons and like money to one side because I think of course we all want to make money and everything yeah. but the love has to be there before you think of the money and for me no matter what it is I'm doing if I'm not into it even if it's making me x amount of money I'm, I'm probably not going to be very good at it yeah. it's like it's like the, the modeling thing yeah. right everyone wants to think that and I'm always like guy, oh, you know the, and I and I think I probably could have gone down that route but in all honesty I'm just not that passionate about it so so I so I just know I'm not going to be that good you know so I think in everything you do figure out why you want to do it like if money's the only reason I, yeah, I promise it's, you it, uh, listen it's tricky take because, it from me as I'm listening to your story I'm just I'm, I'm just thinking that it's so nice that you were so fortunate to find your passion early yeah. on because I remember being in my early 20s and even though I was working in banking mm. You ask me what my passion is. My passion is just to make bread. Yeah, yeah. And it you sounds like... like a joke, but it's a but big it's... problem because yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what I want to do. Of course. I just want to make bread, whatever. It... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just want to make money to live a good life. And, you know. And, and even for me, like, it actually took, like, kind of, like, later on into my late 20s that I realised that, you know what, my passion is helping others. Do you know what mm. I'm saying? Like, I can do it for free, basically. Yeah, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Once you find out, you say it all the time, once you find out what you could do for free, it's like, that's the that's that's basically your passion in it oh 100 percent. and i think going back to what you just said there which i think is such a good point and i think for me that's one thing i always keep in the back of the mind like what 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 i'm doing how how is this going to help somebody else like how can i be a blessed you know we're not blessed so we can stunt yeah we're blessed so we can be a blessing to others others. yeah Yeah, 100 percent. so i'm like okay in everything i do because there's been so many times even now even in the uber coming you know you go through ups and downs with your career sometimes i'm like oh you know what I'm killing it. Yes, I'm. Oh, how, how did I get here? 
the very next day I could wake up I'm thinking, nah, my career, man. Like, oh, what's going on? And you could literally go from one extreme to the other when you work in the kind of industry that we work in where if you wake up and you work, great. If you don't, there's there's nobody. Unlike somebody who has a nine to five, you know you have to be there at nine and finish at five. So you're going to be held accountable. Whereas with what we do, there's no one's... So you really have... You have to keep yourself... Self-motivation is, is a tricky one. And I think if you can find something that can bless you and be a blessing to other people, and it doesn't have to even mean directly, but even sometimes like some, it could be something so small as someone DMing me just being like, Oh Sarah, you know, I saw you on like the other day. I was, I, cause I go back and forth to Uganda a lot and I'm, I do some stuff out there. So I did like an interview a couple of months back. And then yesterday a girl DM me just to be like, Oh, I saw you on TV. I'm so inspired by what you do. And I was going through a really bad time. Like in my head, I was like, my career ain't shit. Like I'm just, you know, just whatever you just go through these times. And then, this young girl messaged me and I felt so touched by that and then it was just that reminder of you know what it's not just about you if you don't follow your dreams that could have an effect on somebody else's dreams and god knows what god's plan for that you know like we're all so connected as human beings that for me like everything I do I'm like if I can inspire even one person then it's a job well done yeah that's Absolutely. that's that's mad what you just said that because that happened to me on the weekend I, went, I was going to Birmingham so I was at Euston Station you know I me mean? just there, I thought, let me quickly get a quick Burger King just before I get onto the train. Mm-hmm. One one brother just come to me like, oh, I follow you. I follow your page. Stop it. I was like, oh, yeah, lovely to meet you. Like, um, mm-hmm. and, then he, and then he was just like, like I f- your page is inspirational to me. Like, it's, 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 emo- he's like, it's emotional. I get emotional when I watch your page. Like, really? And he's like, I, inspi- I, I aspire to be like you. Oh, and wow. you just sit to yourself, rah, like, you're no, literally just me, here. Just me, just... <laughs> Normal person just yeah. like just trying to put out a little nugget, trying yeah. to m- yeah. make a difference. You don't realize that someone's saying, "Raw, actually, I c- I believe I can get there because this yeah. guy yeah. is there." Do you know what I mean? The, someone that looks like me, someone yeah. that comes from a background like me, is right. there, and it's so important, like you said, sharing your story. Like sometimes we're in positions, and you might not you might not be no, happy you where you're see. at, like, yeah, but yeah. you forget the amount of people that just wish they were at where you're at. Yeah. Do you know and what I mean? And then yeah. sometimes you forget that you prayed to be. Come on, come where on. you are today, baby. Well, come listen, on. I have yeah. to catch myself so yeah, many times. Same, same. And I'm like, Lord, I remember when I'd even have a, yeah. a, a pot to piss in and a window to throw it out of. <laughs> now, you know, and then, so sometimes we have to keep ourselves on that, that reminder of where we came from as well. And always looking back and remembering the journey as well. Yeah. It's that balance between s- remaining aspirational, but mm. still being content with yeah. where you are, basically. Where you are, and, exactly. and being grateful as well. Yeah, gratitude. And the maddest part, I think for me, yeah, just be on a rule, like sometimes like, I go, I go on my social media and I see a campaign. I'm like, why am I not? Why yeah. not? And then, and then the second I say it, some another four comes to mind. E man, you're doing bare stuff, you know. Yeah, why, know. Don't be greedy, like. <laughs> don't, like, don't be greedy, time, like. I literally feel like I want to hoover up everything. Like somebody <laughs> else has to like. But you know, I'm done with this. Like, like everything I put my hard work. Trust me, like I see people like, oh, how did they get that? And I'm thinking. Yeah. Big man, you're doing a lot, you know? <laughs> like, you can't have everything, like, do you know what I mean? I'm like, why did they call me? I could have done this, like. And it's like, actually, you have to just remember, like, yeah, like, be, you have to be happy with what you've got. Happy and content. And, that, and, and those things will come all and they will, they will come, you know? But it's, it's so true in what we do. And that's what, so, I feel like social media is built for that. It's like, it's like, it's meant, meant for you to compare yourself to other people. But that's another thing that if you are going into, you know, doing anything that's going to propel you, you want to go from one stage to the other, that's going to take a lot of sacrifice. It has to be sacrificed, right? And a lot of people don't realise, again, like working for free, but you have to know that, yeah, it's a journey and it's going to look different for different people, but no two journeys are the same, right? No, definitely. So, yeah, try, yeah, because I do that all the time. I'm like, ah, they didn't even call me, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of journeys, though, um, let's talk about two transitions, right? Okay. Your transition from working in the NHS originally mm-hmm. into um, being an expert in sexual health. Mm-hmm. And then also your transition from where you started in radio mm-hmm. into television and okay. the rest of the entertainment space. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's go with the NHS first. Okay. So uh, NHS. So I. So before. So I've been specialised in sexual health. So I'm a sexual health nurse, and I have been for the past twelve years, I believe it is. But before that, I worked in acute medicine for five years. Now, with um, whether you're a nurse or a doctor, if you work in the health, you know, you can specialise in whatever specialty that takes your fancy essentially uh, or I could have stayed in the wards for the rest of my life so it really just depends so I worked in acute medicine um, which is a good sort of base as a as a nurse as a junior nurse to get your f- solid foundation of how to be a good nurse kind of thing and all the basic skills so I did that for five years and so halfway you know after that after the after those first few years of my career 
I just came to a natural end. It wasn't anything like I loved acute medicine. Even now, it's my favorite. Um, but I just came to a natural end of my career then I thought okay well and at that point I actually wanted to leave nursing I didn't want to be a nurse anymore I was just like I'm tired I'm exhausted we're always short staffed all all the things that you see read about the NHS in the papers like just dealing with all of that short staffed and like the pressures and everything then I thought no that's it I don't I don't want to be a nurse anymore I need to figure out something else that I want to do it wasn't that I didn't want to be a nurse but I just didn't want to be a ward nurse anymore I think I'd given everything there and so one of the site managers at the time um he was like no so why don't you try something else in nursing like you've always worked for the hospitals like why don't you try a different like a different field and he was like um I'll tell you what there's there's a job advert going at a clinic um it's part of the same trust it, it's just off-site it's, it's based in central London um why don't you apply for that and it's part-time so I thought okay that's great it's part-time because I kind of need a bit of a break to figure out what what direction I'm going in so let me just take this part-time job at this clinic and see what's going on so then I applied for the job um, and then because sexual health is, is a specialty area. So it's very different to your general nursing. So when I went to when I specialized in sexual health, HIV, it was like a co- career change altogether because it's very different. Like on the wards, I'm looking after sick people like, you know, it's life or death. Like you're you're really looking after sexual health is very different. Um, I mean, if you're having sex and you come to the clinic, you're right. Your your life is not a threat, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very different way. It's more like counselling yeah, advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not so much the clinical. So it was a very different and sort of learning everything else in that field. And so I took the job part time. Then I loved it. And for, for in all honesty, because everyone's all the the question I get asked a lot in interviews is, "Why did you do sexual health? You know, what what inspired you to choose?" And I think everyone's always looking for like, "Oh, you know, I really enjoy, you know, something a bit more exciting." <laughs> like the hours i wanted weekends off and i didn't want to do nights so that was kind of the thing to be honest and and it just meant that i can do my side hustle and like do my fashion on the side because i didn't have to do weekends or nights so it kind of tied in nicely with my other career plans and so i thought okay let me go for it specialize in sexual health hiv and honestly and as within the first like week i was like this is my last stop in nursing loved everything that i did like the clinic where i did all my practice uh like all my training and where i and i still practice as a nurse by the way um but in a different capacity um and yeah so i've been there for 12 years and it's just it's the most interesting thing it's the best career move i've ever made it's just you learn so much about human beings through learning about their their sex lives their you know and and your sex life is so intertwined with your other elements of your your life and your your you know your general health and well-being and you, we underestimate how intertwined they are whether you're sexually ac- active or not it is such a, a focal point and when we live in such a hypersexualized society y- you see the effects that you see the knock-on effects like I see it on the shop floor kind of thing and I remember before I did the sex clinic years before the sex clinic even was a thing I remember thinking nah we need a show about this man like <laughs> this is so interesting like the things that come out of like the things that I see the conversations that I have like you money couldn't even you know you could Hollywood couldn't write it like yeah. it's so interesting like the, the the conversation like in a shift in a day let's say I'll see about 30 or 40 patients like th- just imagine just on that just the basic and sometimes it's not even that interesting sometimes it's just b- boring and people just want to come for the bit other times you get so little nuggets and insights in, into human behavior and yeah. w- and why we behave the way we do and things and for me I I really loved and I still love, you know, that that that, uh, that field that I specialised in. Um, and I remember thinking, this would be a really good show. Let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about how that started then. So, yeah. so I take it you became a um, sexual health expert before the show started, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And was that a natural transition, or how did it come about? What transitioning from? Not transitioning from it, but how did the show come did about? The did they yeah. reach out to you or did you pitch it to a production company? Because I guess there's a lot of experts out there because yeah. Iman yeah. and I are experts in in our spaces and mm. we've both got TV shows. And right. It's not always the story that people think it's going to be, basically. So yeah, it's yeah. always good to hear like how it happened. Did you pitch it to a production company or did someone love what you did or on social media or how did it come about? Do you know what? Nothing like that at all. And again, every a lot of things I've done have just sort of come at me. Um, so what happened was um, somebody who I know through who I know through the entertainment side of the, of, of like in the industry, quote unquote, um, who works in TV and she does uh, like a casting director. So she works on several different things. So she had 
heard from one of her colleagues in sort of that world that they they were working this, on this show. So she approached me, and at the time I was doing uh, I was doing radio and I was practicing. I was part time nurse, sexual health nurse, and then I was part time styling radio and all the rest of it. So she knew. She was like, "Oh, by the way, Sarah, Channel Four are doing this show about." like sex and dating and relationships and like sex education and I know that you're and I know you're you're a sexual health nurse and you're a presenter so she's like would you be up for it so I was like yeah I'll be up for it and then that's kind of how it happened and then um and then she put me in touch with the the actual person casting for the show then I did like a zoom um meeting thing um and then then I guess they liked it they passed it on to the um to the the production and then they invited me to Hammersmith where, where the, which is where the production office was at the time then I did like a uh, uh what you call it casting like a video like a proper one um and then yeah that's how it happened and then I found out through the great grapevine like after the first series like I think after that the rap party we'll just talk and stuff and I was like how did you guys put us all together because we all got on so well so me so there's those three of us me being a nurse then we had a doctor then we had a health advisor which is like the main core team in a sexual health clinic um so we had the three of us and we all just got on straight away everyone thought we knew each other so we were like oh so guys how did you put this show together like because you got the casting on point like we all like bounce off really well off each other and then she was like oh so Sarah when we did the casting so when you do a show like this when you're putting together a team it's like putting together a band so when you put together a band you have to f- find the person who's going to be like the face of it, like the, the heart of it and then you find people who you think would gel with them and so they were like Sarah when we found you we knew we wanted you to be sort of the face of the show and then we found people who we thought would gel well with you and I remember thinking this is so random because nobody like you said earlier no one goes to nursing school for money or to be on yeah, tv yeah. like it's, it's not crazy like and there's no other nurses in the public I, I mean forgive me if I'm like missing somebody out but it's just not a thing you see that doctors on tv but people don't really know what nurses do like people don't really actually know and and then the role of the nurse has evolved over the years like and so for me i was like this is really such a good opportunity just to highlight what it is that a sexual health nurse does and um yeah and i was like so surprised by that but it definitely wasn't like a career like a a conscious uh career move it was something that happened and then yeah now here we are seven years later <laughs> it's crazy because the events in your life it kind of feels like it's just been you going with your passion and going with the flow but it almost feels like it's by design because yeah if you turn your nose up at doing radio for three years mm. you wouldn't have hit that tv show no. as a presenter as clean as you would as you did basically right, right Do you know what right. i'm trying to say so it's almost like everything happened for a reason and yeah it's just gone to pay dividends. Do you know what the funny thing dividends. is? I think when I was, I always thought, oh, it'd be cool to be a presenter. Like I'd love to be on TV and like, you know, do the whole thing. But like when you come from, like I, I'm from a working class background. Like I'm, you know, I don't know anybody growing up who was on TV or did anything in fashion or so careers like that just felt so unattainable. So even if you might think, oh yeah, it'd be cool to do that. You didn't think really, yeah, I'm yeah. going to yeah, do that. I'm gonna yeah. do it. <laughs> Who's done that that you know or they can name, right? So it was never something that I thought would, was possible but if you had asked me a few years ago then I'd say yeah actually that would be really cool to like host my own show or like to like you know that kind of thing because I, I think I am a people person so there's something like that would feel quite organic but it's not until it came along that I was like actually do you know what I'm, I might be all right at this I might have like there might be something here that I can go with um and so yeah that's kind of where we are <laughs> so obviously you mentioned being Ugandan and so forth mm. uh, African and that and then you did the sex clinic. <laughs> I'm Nigerian and I know. Listen, like, what know. were your parents, your your aunties, your uncles, family members? When you're on that show, and the way that, obviously, we know edits, innit? Yeah. Like, once course. you're in TV, you understand that edits, like, it didn't really happen. Like, it doesn't it really happen that, that way. Right, but right, right. they've edited, so it makes it look like it happened that way. And, and that's TV. That's, that's, that's their job. Yeah. <laughs> but when your family... Mm-hmm are seeing this show mm-hmm. and they're what is the conversation how are you explaining Sarah that I sent to school to go and learn nursing <laughs> do you know what they, they make everything generic as well she has a sex show on TV can you imagine like sex show sex show all the education we gave her and it's sex that she wants to specialise in oh on the national television I'm finished I need to know, like, what was the... How did you explain it to them? Do you know what? Oh, my God. Sorry, you guys are cracking me up. 
I'm so fortunate in that. Okay, first of all, my mum's a nurse as well, right? So my mum, yeah, so my mum comes from a health background as well. So she gets, she gets that because a lot of my aunts and uncles didn't really get the, in that perspective. Because a lot of my cousins, like, oh my god, Tara, what did auntie say? I'm like, <laughs> like, what did auntie say? I was like, auntie's cool. And my dad, God rest his soul, he's been gone for twelve years. But my my, my parents were together for a hundred years. Um, but my dad's been growing for twelve years, and my dad was like proper african dad like if you think if you think if you put african dad in the dictionary you see a picture of my dad there so and and i remember thinking oh but but, but my dad passed before oh, i before did the sh- yeah before i did the sex clinic but no my as strict as my dad was my parents are very liberal as well so in terms of like if i was doing something like the sex clinic they know that hey i'm a professional i'm a healthcare professional yeah, yeah, yeah. it's different if, if, it, if it was me <laughs> on the other side of the table putting my business out on the streets then we might be having a very different conversation but i think my mom my mom was like because i remember thinking oh yeah my, my mom was like yeah it's educational of course yeah my mom was very supportive she was never like oh what will people no my mom was like yeah people need to, this is educational like young people need to know you know that the risks are out there to how to protect themselves that like, this is something that we need so in terms of my family to be honest not really i didn't really really get any no there was a few aunties of course so like, ah, are you sure you want to be i'm like auntie it's just you know it's i'm it's not me i'm just there telling them you know so yeah in terms of that no i've always had a lot of support from from my family in terms of that and it's never been like a thing of oh you're talking about this no my parents are very liberal in that in that sense um as long as you're not shaming the family name <laughs> or doing anything like that but my parents know i'm, I'm a nurse i'm a qualified person and it's educational so and so I always wanted to know what is it like did, when you learned this this stuff like when you were studied and you learned did they teach you like how to react like when because <laughs> someone's just gonna pull his things in front of you like you're just gonna just act like yeah no the thing is, is it, right is it not, yeah no because everyone always wonders like how do you let me tell you like it nothing phases you but also everything's about context right yeah. If I'm in here and somebody takes charge of, yes, I'm going to, uh, you know. <laughs> but within a healthcare setting, within a professional setting, no, it's, it's normal. It's like, it's like giving birth or anything, you know. Yeah, technically, it's not the most, you know, nice position to be in. But that's, it's natural, Yeah, and you I, know, yeah. And I guess in the health clinic, they, they describe it first. So you kind of know what's coming. So there's a gamble. You don't always know there's, what's coming. <laughs> there's, there's pus everywhere. So <laughs> You know what's coming, basically. Allow it. You know what's Allow coming. It. <laughs> Allow it. You get intro. <laughs> but you know, what? One, one thing that like makes people like scared of going to the sexual health clinic is the idea of, of course, it's personal. You're getting naked in front of a perfect stranger. Of course, like, it's not. But one thing I always say to people who are like nervous or like, like p- people really get anxious about going to the sexual health. You have to remember that, who, first of all, the person you're seeing has chosen to work in that specialty. I've nobody's dragged me off the street off my will to be like you have to you must look at. So you have to remember that people there and we've seen everything. Yeah. That's another thing. Like there's nothing that anyone can at this point, you know, anyone can shock me. But um yeah, people always get nervous of the idea of which is natural of course, naturally. But um you have to always remember whoever you're seeing has seen it all before has heard it all before. There's nothing that's going to shock them or make them like freak out or be like, oh, and they've chosen to specialise in this field. And, it, yeah. and it's important to go out and get help if you need it. Yeah, definitely. Like, yeah. But it can be embarrassing. Like I remember, I remember, I remember when I had to, I had to get um, checked because I was just like, oh, you know, you start reading stuff online, you're like, oh my goodness. And then you give yourself two weeks start, to you, live. Now, you, now, you've, now you think you're going to die at any second, like, or something, something's going to blow up or something. And then it's like, now you're thinking, do I go? Now you're saying... Do I want to see a guy? Do I want a woman? Mm. Like, and it's this, this mad. Thing. Before you know, you say forget it. Just forget it. I just don't. Before you know, you're like, <laughs> you've talked yourself out of it. But it's it's so important that you go there and you and you actually just you know, like you said, you understand that this person's here. This is their job. Yeah. They've done it before. There's nothing that you're gonna show them they haven't seen before. Yeah. And and get checked out because at the end of the day, you only got one life. Do you this know is, what I mean? This is it. And sometimes, especially with us, like you know, prostate cancer is something that I'm really big on because mm. in the, in, as black men, we don't get checked. Right. And like because because they're old, you know, they got to check you through your bum, so man, are nervous or whatever. But it's evolved now. They, they don't even do that. They don't even do that yeah. anymore. But, so, but people are dying that yeah. they don't need to die because yeah. they're not getting checked out. Yeah. So that's why this conversation is so important that, you know, actually people do go out there and do get checked and don't allow the fear to kind of make the embarrassment of, of embarrassment, it. Embarrassment, yeah, exactly. There, there has been some really good initiatives um, previously as well. Because in my uni, they used to give you free cinema tickets when you go to the clinic. Ah, oh, really? So it changed 
everything. Come on. Like, guys are talking to each other saying, yeah, I'm going to clinic. Like, it's yeah. an open conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. everybody knows you get free cinema tickets. And remember, you're a uni student, like, free cinema tickets is a massive deal. Yeah, <laughs> Do you get what I'm trying to say? So, it's literally an open conversation between guys and girls yeah. in the uni. Like, everybody went to the clinic mm. yeah, regularly, yeah. basically. Yeah. So, it's crazy how, like, um, yeah, cultures different incentive can be changed. And yeah, yeah. Exactly. Just open up the conversation. Because I think oftentimes, people are reluctant to have these conversations about, especially to their children before they go into the world, about sex, dating. Because a lot of parents fear that if I talk to my child about sex, then I'm going to plant the seed, then they're going to be thinking about sex, and then they're going to go out and do it. Actually, it's the opposite. I find that the, cho- the, the young people who are more likely to take, take risks, to do things that they're not ready for, not comfortable with, or don't know what they're doing, are the ones who have not been given that guidance or feel like I can't talk to mum and dad at home. So if they can't talk to mum and dad at home or a sibling or auntie, whoever that they feel comfortable at home, yeah. guess where they're going to learn? TikTok, their friends. Because as much as you can protect your children, they're going to go out to school with other parents who may not be as vigilant as you to protect them. So best it come from you. So I think for me, one of my favourite parts of my career as a sexual health nurse, I used to be the lead nurse for the Young People Service. So I would go to schools, I would go and do like sex education in secondary schools with the boys. I would um, go to like youth centres and, and I started this group for um, young girls, teenage girls who were at risk of being groomed for like gangs, for, as like sex traffic through gangs and things. So we'd have like these workshops every Wednesday and Friday, like these drop-in centres and these young girls were coming. Not always to have a sexual health game. Some of them have never even had sex. But it's so important to equip young people with the knowledge before they and then they can make decisions and then they can feel empowered and say actually do you know what I'm, I'm not going to send you any pictures or I'm not going to do anything because actually I spoke to Sarah and you know you know and it gives that and then you sort of and that's why it's so important to have these conversations no matter what sort of religious background you come from or your own personal views this is this is normal that sex is natural and talking about it should be natural as well and i think talk i don't know even how we got into this this subject but talk you know talking to young people about it and i think that's yeah that's something that i'm so passionate about so and I see, I see your face on buses, the tube. Yeah, let's like, talk about that. What's it like being the face of HIV? Because it's like, <laughs> it's mad when you think about it. Like HIV is something that is so far removed. Like we don't really talk about it at all. Yeah. Like it exists, but if you talk about it, what you think about is Magic Johnson. Like that's yeah, it. Like yeah, you don't right? really. Other than that, you don't really feel like. But it's something that's you know killing people. It's something that's affecting people in in loads of different communities. And then you are now like I see you on all these posters. Everywhere, bus stops, billboards. Like, what is it like being the face of such something so that, that's had historically such a negative exactly connotation, yeah, yeah, connotation yeah, yeah. to it? So then you would feel like, oh, I'm the face. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a brave thing to do. I yeah, think. I agree. Very brave. I mean, I could be modelling God or lingerie or whatever. Yeah, exactly. You know, but no, I think you know. If not me, who, you know? I think when we think about the risk factors for HIV, and, you know, I'll keep it to the UK because this is where we live and this is where we're at. Um, the, the the risk group factors are people who have immigrated from, from sub-Saharan Africa, people in the LGBT community. So when we do the campaign, um, and I work with Terence Higgins Trust, I've been working with them for years, brilliant, number one HIV charity, and they do such a great job, and they've been doing it, yeah, for... God knows how many years now. Um, so whenever they do the campaign, they always want to find people from from the com- from the community, so that when people do look and someone can look at my name and say, "Oh, she's a bantu like me," or she's you know you know it, it, uh, relatable, yeah. you know. So for me, if I can lend my face, my name for whatever, and even if it's one person that thinks, "Oh, okay." you know oh sarah did it so yeah let me do it Th- then then that's then that's it isn't it um and it's a charity so i don't get paid for it or anything like that and it's it, but i'm so passionate about it and it's not even and it's just about educating people so they have up to date knowledge and information about hiv like it's not like the stone ages where really if you're diagnosed that was you know you get your ducks in a row and like start you know getting your no hiv like now you can be hiv positive have unprotected sex not pass it on to your partner you know you can have a child you can live to a normal life expectancy because i think what it is is it's more and it's also not only about preventing people from becoming hiv positive but also supporting people who are living with hiv because when we have a lot of these conversations for example like when people come into clinic and and it really bugs me and i always pull people up on it i'm like okay who's the last person you had sex with oh uh, this person three weeks ago okay um and do you know the hiv status oh yeah yeah they were clean and i'm always like language is very important because if you say that person's clean that's to imply that somebody's hiv is dirty and it's about moving just educating ourselves about 
language language yeah. is so important the power you know the tongue um so for me i'm very passionate about supporting people living with hiv raising awareness because actually now because in the uk is men who have sex with men have traditionally been the highest risk group people but now because of things like preventative measure like pre-exposure prophylaxis treatment so most men who have sex with men in the uk are on hiv preventative treatment so we found that we really pretty much no longer diagnose hiv anymore within the gay community but now we find that heterosexual like white heterosexual people are the ones or just heterosexual people in general are now being diagnosed more for the first time than gay people in the uk so now the tide has shifted so we still have work to do but now we need to normalize that so it's worked in that community but now we have to take it to yeah because i think it's one of those things think oh well i'm not from that community or i don't do this or i don't so therefore it's not whereas now we're seeing people who don't don't tick the boxes for any of the risk factors, but are testing positive. So now we're reshifting the way in which we market the campaign that is actually now is everybody's business. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, no, I love I, lo- I love working with Terrence Higgins. And, yeah, it's, it's just... And I, we always get so much feedback um, off the back of that campaign. And every year we see the numbers skyrocket of people testing. So it, 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 it does what it's, it's supposed to do. I think that um, as an expert, it's... it's amazing the work you do and like you say you do a lot of work for free but this is the bread and butter podcast this and, is the and, bread and butter podcast and you've got bills to pay right <laughs> so, lord so knows i got them bills <laughs> <laughs> so talk to us how being um um a uh, sexual health expert mm. can translate into earnings and yeah yeah so what sort of bits you do basically yeah so do you know what when i made that transition from um sort of when i went into tv it was like a bit of sweet thing in a way, to be honest, because at the time when I went on TV, I was at the height of my career in fashion. I was at, at this point, I was a fashion editor now. So which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a fashion editor. So I had that title, you know, I was planning to do stuff like in LA, London, like my career in fashion was like, was doing it. Um, I still wasn't making as much money as I wanted to, but things were in the pipeline and like I was in a really good position um, and I was quite happy. And then the sex clinic came. So then I was like, okay, well, First of all, fa- fashion editor, that's that's more, actually, that's more stress than, than the styling, than the, the, being a nurse, to be honest. Like, the fashion editor stuff, that was a lot more stress. So, at the time, before I did the sex clinic, I was doing part-time as a nurse. Um, then I was doing my fashion editor stuff, but I was quite happy in where I was. And then the, se- and then the sex clinic came along. And, of course, I wasn't going to turn out. That was a really good opportunity. So, I was like, I'm not going to turn that down. But then I was like, okay, well, how do I market myself? Because, on one hand, everyone knows me, at, like, p- publicly, Everyone knew me as a stylist, yeah. fashion editor. No one really knew I was a nurse unless you needed to know I was a nurse because it wasn't what I was doing publicly. Yeah. It was just what I've always done. So for me, I, I yeah, so I never thought my plan B will now be my plan A and like everything, you know. So then when I did the sex clinic, I'd have loads of people being like, Sarah, did I just see your, your head in someone's crotch on TV? Like people, like people who knew me in fashion who didn't know that I was a nurse and people who know me for years. They're like, what? So what? What is you know? They didn't. Know. And then I thought, okay, what am I doing with my career? Because on one hand, I'm in fashion. On the other hand, I'm a nurse. It's great and it's good that I'm you know doing all the things, but I'm not. I need to really pick a lane and fi- and find a focus of what I'm doing. So then the sex clinic became a big thing because of course once you're on TV, it's a massive platform. And then I was getting lots of different job opportunities off the back of that. And I was still practicing as a nurse. So then I thought, okay, you know what? And then COVID hit. So then when COVID hit, I was like, well, I didn't have a choice because everything in the creative industry stopped anyway. So then all that kept going was my nursing, funnily enough. So when, so when that, that was a good reminder for me. Like when push comes to shove, my nursing career will always be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that the creative industry. So I remember thinking, thank God I kept my nursing career. But anyway, so then when I went back to COVID, the industry, like the creative industry, sort of everything went a bit, you know, as we all know. And like, I think we're still trying to recover from it. But then I decided to step down as a fashion editor. And I was ready at the time anyway, sex clinic or not. And then during that time in COVID, went back to the hospital to help out. And then that's the time I was thinking, okay, what am I doing in my career? Do I go back? Like, at, at this point, we would even know if we'd ever get out of COVID yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah, crazy so time, innit? <laughs> I was just happy to be alive at that point. Um, but then I thought, okay, well, I've done the fashion edits a bit. I don't think I want to do it. So what else can I do? And then I thought, okay, do you know what? Let me focus on on like sex education because that's what I'm passionate about as well as fashion. But that, that's what I was doing more of. And then I found myself feeling more fulfilled through doing that than I did with fashion. And I think fashion, by the time I left, it wasn't like, it wasn't, yeah, I'd kind of felt like I was ready to move on from that. And so I thought, okay, well, let me focus on what I'm doing with sex education. And that's kind of how 
I forgot the question now. <laughs> no, no, you're good, you're good, you're good. So how did you transition into like earnings based? Ah, uh, earnings, that's what it was. Yeah. So then I thought, okay, you know what? I'm not, I've, I've stepped down from, you know, the uh, the fashion editor gig. Let me focus on where the money is and what I'm actually, what I'm good at. What I, Not what I'm good at, but what... Um, the value you the, add. the value that I'm adding. And I was getting more value from from that. And then I, and then I had different projects in TV. I did some stuff with Durex, did like different brand collaborations. So I was really starting to see, you know, the money coming through in, in terms of that. So that's kind of how, and then I thought, okay, well, I've got, I've done the sex clinic now. I've got this platform what do I do with it then I thought okay well nobody else is doing what I'm doing in terms of like I'm the only nurse in the public eye in the country sex education yes there's loads of people who do like sex positive stuff but none of them have a clinical background or the or, or the qualifications to do so so I thought okay well I'm in a really unique position here um and so there was a, a, a niche in the market for me which is quite hard to find so when I found that I was like okay you know what off the back of this there's so much I can do so like hence now we're doing the podcast and like other stuff and like we both do test pack lunch and so so I do a lot of like sex education in the in the sort of public sphere like lots of brand collaborations I work with Love Honey as their health ambassador so for me that's how I've managed to take my you know my career as a nurse and then sort of re- repurpose it in a way um and think okay well how can I do this on a public sphere working with different brands and then making that into because that's where I make the money I could and you know I still and I still work in the NHS and brands like to know that I work in the yes, NHS of course. as well credibility Credib- you're, of course you're still relevant you know what's you're I up know to date I'm up to date with all the teachings exactly all the that. new treatments everything like that but also I love what I do like it's yeah I just I love what I do and the way in which I work now is perfect because I work as a freelance nurse now so I could if I decide I don't want to work for two weeks I don't work for two weeks if I want to work every day for the next month I can work every day. so it's quite nice because it now my work-life balance works for me um and I now I've taken my career as a, you know my qualifications and doing it on a public so it, it, it then changes your income is different because now when I do things with brands I'm not an NHS nurse on a band six or whatever yeah now I'm using my public pl- platform that I've built that I've worked hard for and then and you charge and a premium then, for it yeah and then and then charge them for it yeah yeah so if I was to try and articulate it what we're saying is that your NHS career is your foundation it's yes. your credibility yeah and it's uh uh, the basis of why you can be a trusted face in that space. Right, exactly. It, your television is not a shop window. <laughs> yeah. It adds the gloss. It adds that premium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the brand, the brand deals is the real bread and yeah, butter. Yeah, that's the bread day, and butter. That's the bread <laughs> and butter. On a day-to-day basis, yeah, basically. Yeah, exactly. That's nice, man. And it's yeah. good for people to hear that as well, because there's a lot of people that will be doing something. They're an expert in it. Yeah. And they... Um, We've learned so many lessons because one of the key things was telling people about what you do. Mm. And you went through a phase where when you was on TV, no one knew what you did. But you said, hold on, I need to take it back a bit. Make a social media platform and tell people what I do. Yeah. And that's obviously paid dividends as well. So there's so many lessons that we've learned here. That's the thing, because the thing is, getting on TV is one thing. But what you do with the with that platform and that opportunity outside of because you could do a series for a show that's like six episodes yeah it could be a, that show might get commissioned again or might not get commissioned again who knows right <laughs> who, knows? who knows who knows right <laughs> but what how are you gonna you even if you get one episode two episodes whatever one season how are you gonna use that yeah. to your benefit to be like okay how can I build on this platform to yeah. say that okay I'm I'm qualified to talk about A B and C because of X Y and Z because I did you know. So that is, yeah, that's, and even now in TV, TV is not the most well-paid thing. And that's the thing people will see on TV. Oh, listen, and you know, we're African, innit? So back home, everyone, ah, the school uh, fees, yeah. the school fees, yeah. Auntie's got to a hospital for the fifth time. You know, everyone thinks you've got money because you're on TV now. But it's like, no, TV's not, you don't make your money from TV. No. Nah. TV is a platform that gives you the credential and you can, you know, yeah. but just because someone's on TV doesn't mean they're making money. So if you get an opportunity in TV and you don't, capitalize on it yeah it's all for then it's all for show it's all for clout and that's the thing about i love about your story is that like everything you wanted to be you could you could have you you would have achieved like you wanted to you wanted you wanted to become a present wanted to be presenting you always wanted to be presenting you got an opportunity you took it yeah. you became an editor you could have carried on with that you decided not yeah. you done the tv you took that and then you know the modeling you could have done that you start like nursing you could have gone do you know what yeah, i mean yeah, it's yeah. like Every, there's just something in you that whatever you put your mind to, mm. you can achieve it. Where does that come from? Oh, gosh. Do you know what? I don't... I really wish I had, like, a really glossy answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I don't know. I don't know if it's a personality trait. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I, 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 I've, I've always been somebody who's um, have different layers. In, and I think that's all of us. I don't think that makes me even special or unique in any way. I think we all have different sides of us, you know. You know, like, it's like being a parent, right? You've got your coochie coochie side, but you've got that I'll beat you down side, you know? Like, you have different, you know, elements of you. So, for me, I always tap into the different parts of my character. Um, and then if I can... But I'm a creative person by nature, so I'm, I'm I always w- want to do something creative. Even though I'm not working in fashion the way I used to, I still make stuff at home. I'm still doing that, you know. I I, I always have that kind of outlet. Um, I think for me, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's like a. I just go with the flow, yeah. but I think I always go where my I always follow my heart. If if I if I can see an opportunity in something and I'm passionate about it and I believe in it. I'll always go for it. Like, I think it's a self-confidence thing. You need to have that self-confidence. I think the minute you start to doubt yourself, you need to tell yourself, I can do it. If you have that mindset of, as long as I'm willing to work, and also I'm a hard worker, yeah. and I'm patient, and I'm, re- and, I'm re- and I'm realistic. I think, I think life, I think because I started out so young in my career as a nurse, I think I matured quite early on in life. I was into the workforce at quite a young age. So I always had that discipline of um, I have to go to school and to work. So I always, I've always done more than one thing at any given time. Anyway, so from the minute my national insurance number came through, I've always had a weekend job. As long as have, as well as having a weekend job, I'm studying as well. Or I'm trying to build something in some industry or something. So I've always had that, that it's always been programmed in me to do multiple things at multiple times. And the good thing, and this is what I love about nursing as well, is it's one of the best career choices because of the um, the flexibility it can give you. Because yeah. I think nursing gets like bad rep in terms of as a career because we only hear like the terrible things about it. But actually, it's one of the best professions you can go into if you have other things that you're interested in because you can work, you know, as an agency nurse, you can, you know, work as and when you want. And then for me, I think being a nurse is what helped me do everything else because I can do extra shifts. Yeah. Uh, or take time off and so it's a career that I can sort of work around my other work demand so, so high isn't it yeah, so, yeah so I've always managed to sort of do other things and build my career as a nurse and still still while working as a nurse still building my career as a nurse and still going for opportunities and being you know going from a junior nurse to a senior nurse and like doing all that kind of thing so while I was doing my my career I didn't neglect my nursing career I was still studying and you know working towards that as well so I think for me I think it's self-confidence um but also I think I I do also give my parents credit that for me I think it's starts at the home and my parents never again you know you know what our parents could be like if you're not a doctor or an engineer you basically failed didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> you're not an accountant what are you doing whereas my parents were never like that my dad was always like i don't care if you want a degree in cutting grass you have to make sure a you get that degree and b you're the best grass cutter <laughs> yeah in, facts. In, in in this city of london like whatever you want to do be the be- he has to require a degree, <laughs> number one, and to be the best of, of of that you can be. And I think because of that, my parents always made me think you can do whatever you want. Like anything is possible. So I think that mindset, I was never restricted from a young age as to what I should be or what I shouldn't be. My parents were always just like, don't shame the family name and stay on the straight and narrow kind of thing. So I think I've always, and my parents have always pushed me to, like if I'm doing something, my mum's there cheerleading, my dad, you know, like, so I think for me, definitely I have a solid foundation in terms of the way I was raised and who I was raised by. And I think that's what's like giving me the opportunities that I've had. What would you say that you're grateful for? One thing that you're grateful for in your life, in your career? In, in my life, in my career, I'm grateful for the grace of God above everything, more than anything. Um, I'm grateful for my family because that's my foundation. Um, I'm very close to my siblings, my parents and everything. Um, I think those are the two things that, I, that I'm built on. I think that's, those are two things that make me who I am and who is sat here on the sofa today. So those are things I'm grateful for. Um, and just also just grateful for the opportunities that I've been given in life, you know. Um, it's never, and I do have to catch myself sometimes. Yeah. Always have to catch myself. Sometimes I'm moaning, I'm like, oh, then I have to, oh, God, I'm sorry, because I know I'm trifling. But, you know, sometimes it's that you have to be in constant reminder of remembering where you came from and where you are. And that, you know, it's a, it's, it's a journey, it's about the journey and not the destination. So for me, I'm just grateful to all, to still be working, to, to, to have a really good team behind me. I've got a great team here in the UK and in Uganda as well. So I'm doing stuff over across Africa. I'm a Pan-Africanist, so I want to be all over the continent. Um, so I want to do stuff out there as well. Um, yeah, there's a lot to be grateful for. So 
throughout this, we've seen all your success, all you've been able to achieve. But we know that where there's success, there's always failure. There's always yeah. things that go wrong. Talk, talk to us about maybe some of the hard times that you've been through. Because we, pe- we want people to leave with a realistic, okay, yeah, I want to be like Sarah, but mm-hmm. it wasn't always rosy. Or t- talk about some hard times that you've been through or things that maybe didn't go as well as you wanted and how you overcame them. Yeah, we, we, we tend to do biggest W and biggest L. Okay, oh God. So biggest let's start with the biggest L first, actually. Biggest L. Oh my gosh, what's my biggest L? Okay, I'd say, I'd say... Because of COVID, so you guys, obviously you guys know the sex clinic, right? So the sex clinic is E4's most successful original series. Wow. So did really well and we went viral with everything, right? Yeah. And you would with a show like that, right? So it so well, so well. Now, the the reason why the sex clinic was was put together in the first place was because there was a, you know, STRs were soaring, like people were just moving mad and, you know, everything was going crazy. So so Channel 4 were like, you know, there was a social purpose for it, like a a public health um, sort of purpose for the show. And so the whole show was about not only encouraging people to talk about sex, dating, relationships, but also to come in and do a sexual health check on on TV. That was the the like the heart of the show. But the issue with this sex clinic, even though everything like the stories, everything, everyone loved that, the contributors, of course, they have to they have to give the okay for everything that's aired. So as much as people are happy to talk about their sex lives and wondering, nobody wants to be diagnosed with an STI in national TV, right? Or people will go and do a test beforehand, but then they'll come and say, oh, I've been in Magaloo for, tw- you know, and I slept with 20 people and now I'm on, and then everything at the end is negative. So the, the whole, in the end, we had so, like everything, everyone was negative at the end and that everyone was giving all these stories. So it defeated the purpose of the show. So because of that, in the end, we couldn't go on with the show. Because the whole point of the show is to show people, look, there's consequences to to a high risk behavior and like just sort of driving home the reason for that. So in the end, and then COVID hit and then everyone lost money. So so a lot of shows were not recommissioned. So I think the sex clinic was one of them. They, they never tell you that it's not going. You just yeah. stop hearing it. Yeah. So um so I think after the after COVID I think for me that was my biggest L because like everybody else I was thinking what am I going to do with my my career because because the fashion I was over fashion like I'd ticked that box I'd done the fashion editor thing so I was kind of like right I've done that I'm happy I'm I'm ready to move on to the next phase and then the sex clinic didn't come back so I was thinking well what am I going to you know so I was thinking well what am I doing I, mean, I was like a bit of in limbo so I'd say that was my biggest L because at the time I didn't see I didn't have any clear direction of where my career was going to go if I'd be able to sort of um you know do anything else like in tv like was was everything going to go back to normal so i think for me that was a stressful time in my career because like and, and i think that's everybody really i say covid time um but now looking back i'm glad that it wasn't like everything has worked out the way it should have yeah yeah yeah, yeah. tv's a, a bit of a funny one sometimes i describe it as like lost at sea because <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'm, when you're waiting for that recommission, there's no sign of anything else exactly, coming exactly. anytime soon. Yeah. Like, it's nuts. And initially and you that, can think, oh, this is this is the the, the platform. This well. is what's going to really... And that's what... And I think if you're going into thinking, yeah, you can get that, but that's... Getting your foot through the door is one thing. Yeah. Maintaining it, like, like, don't get gas, basically. Yeah. Don't put all your eggs... In. Always always be ready for this industry. Is, is, nothing's guaranteed, is it? Yeah. So I think for me, that was the probably the, the biggest L because then I, I was in a space where I thought, what am I going to do with myself? Like, would I, you know, do I have a career to go back to after COVID? Am I going to have to go back to like work in the wars full time again? Like fashion, the creative industry was c- completely, that one was just not even an, like nothing was going on there. Yeah. Um. Then, but yeah. So for me, I think that was a stressful time where I just didn't know what I was doing or where I was going. Yeah. Then what about Biggest W? Let's talk about that Durex money. Oh, okay. Come on, <laughs> that boot, that boot spread, that boot spread. Trust me, that thing, that thing, stainless steel, man. Trust stainless me, stainless steel. That check never bounces. Let me not even lie to you. Yeah, so I say, <laughs> you know, I say Durex is one of the one of the biggest brands I work. With. Like, yeah, yeah in terms nice, of yeah. like, yeah, I went home quite comfortable that day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that day, by the way, guys, twenty four hours. Listen, I'll say you lot. Okay, 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 yeah, there's definitely something in there. Um, yeah, my biggest W. Oh, do you know what? There's been so many wins. And a lot of my biggest W's are not money. They didn't generate me a lot of money, in all honesty. Um, I would say, do you know, I was really proud of the fashion show because we did it for three years and we built it and it really, yeah. So by the time I left, I was really proud of that, doing radio, considering I hadn't 
had any experience. I'd say that was one of my biggest wins because I think that was the that was the the biggest opportunity that 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 sort of uh, changed my career path. Yeah. Like the biggest skill jump. Basically. Yeah, it was the biggest skill jump, and it came from nowhere. I wasn't nowhere. expecting it. And then yeah. off the back of that, I, like like you said before, I wouldn't have gone into TV. I wouldn't have yeah. gone into so many different things had it not been for that. for that. So I'd say that because that's what sort of changed the direction of my the trajectory of my career. Cool, that's so good to hear. That's big, man. It's been amazing hearing your story. Oh, it's been so... It's been like therapy. I need you, I, I love it when people say that. I love it, you know, man. I love it. Honestly. I love it, I love you it. You love to invoice me. <laughs> Seriously. No, no, thank you. Sarah, just thank you for, for just being you. Oh, um, thank you guys Listen, you. I am I'm so proud of you. Like, I'm, I'm so, so proud of you. Like, I see every every day I see, every time you post, I just, I just see you and I just think to myself, like, thank God you chose to do what oh. you're supposed to do. Oh. Like, and sometimes... Like you said, you said before, if not me, then who? And it's it's so important to understand that, like we are in these privileged positions, like. But some, if we don't do it, somebody else will do it. Like, mm. but I'm so happy that you decided to do it, and and you make it so, like, because of you, it's like, and, and the way you deliver stuff, it just makes these things feel so unawkward, oh. especially coming from an African. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The way it is, like, yeah, I've never had a conversation with my parents about sex mm. until I started having kids. Yeah. And then my mum said, oh, yeah, I having too much sex, there's too many kids. <laughs> and I got four kids. That was the first, after I had that's four kids, combo. that's the first combo we ever had about sex. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Imagine. So it's like, they, we don't have these conversations, yeah. but to see somebody that you feel like comes from your community yes. and can deliver sounds like you, can deliver this message, mm. makes you more comfortable to be able to say, okay, let me go and get checked. Let me go and make sure I'm doing the Right let, me talk to my kids. let me talk to my yeah. kids let me make sure this isn't awkward for them yeah, do you know what I mean and, sure. gi- and you give us the right language to be able to to have these conversations right. so thank you for just walking in your purpose because you're just making the world a better place so oh, thank, thank you so you much guys. Thank oh, you guys can I come back again <laughs> absolutely honestly I loved it thank you so much for having me guys it's been amazing it's been a pleasure having you so guys that is the Bread and Butter podcast we will see you on the next one make sure you comment like and subscribe